Hello, welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barrett. And I'm Chaz Lichadello. And he's George the Dog. <gasps> it is our final show for the year. There's plenty of news to talk about, though, including the latest on the COVID variant and a huge Supreme Court case which could see abortion banned in large parts of America. We're also going to look ahead to some of the major stories in the next few weeks and months, including Biden's big spending bill and some high-profile candidates stepping up. But first... <laughs> And first, it is to the major development in the global coronavirus pandemic this week, what appears to be a highly contagious new variant. With the new COVID variant Omicron spreading around the world, President Biden says he's not considering any widespread U.S. lockdown. This variant is a cause for concern, not a cause for panic. Late last week, the World Health Organization designated the variant B11529, or Omicron, a variant of concern after it was identified by researchers in South Africa. The WHO says it is not yet clear if it's more transmissible, more easily spread from person to person. It's also not yet clear if it causes more severe disease. They do warn it may more easily cause reinfection if you've had another variant of COVID. And as for how effective existing vaccines are against it, well, they're working on it. And President Biden's prescription? Step one, buy some time with a ban on travel from eight countries in Southern Africa. Despite experts questioning the benefits of the move and raising concerns it punishes South Africa for being so transparent. Step two, boosters for the vaccinated and another push for the unvaccinated to finally get a jab. You have to get your vaccine. You have to get the shot. You have to get the, get the booster if you're... The sooner or later, we're going to see cases of this new variant here in the United States. And this week, those new cases arrived. The Biden administration is now tightening pre-travel testing requirements to one day prior to departure and enforcing other winter COVID measures, including mandatory masks on all planes and other public transport. The first US Omicron variant case was confirmed in California yesterday, with cases in two more states today. Biden's top medical advisor, Dr Anthony Fauci, explained why it's causing him such concern. It has the molecular characteristics that would strongly suggest that it would be more transmissible. It has a bunch of mutations a disturbingly large number of mutations in the spike protein, which is the business end of the virus, which really binds, particularly in one particular component of that spike that binds to the receptors in your body, in your nose, in your, in your nasopharynx, and in your lung. The mutations would strongly suggest that it would be more transmissible and that it might evade some of the protection of monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasma and perhaps even antibodies that are induced by vaccine. Well, that's not great, but there is some more reassuring news coming from South African Dr Angelique Coetzer, the chair of that nation's medical association. Looking at the mildness of the symptoms that we are seeing, currently there's no reason for panicking as we don't see severely ill patients. Now, according to Fox News and Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul, we should be listening to Dr Coetzer, not so much Dr Fauci or Joe Biden, and certainly not the media, other than Fox, obviously. So we have the introduction of Omicron. You have the way in which the South African doctor has characterized it, which is thankfully unusually mild. Yet when you watch the media, elected officials, they're on hyperdrive on the fear index. Your response to where we are right now with this now third iteration. You know, I think the hysteria gets the better of the media and we need to calm down, take a breath and see what this is. Now, if it turned out to be worse, then we're going to have to, you know, make some decisions. Oh, so apart from the swipe at the media, Rand Paul is actually saying pretty much what Joe Biden is saying. Don't panic. Let's see what this is. How refreshing to see Fox doing a reasonable, calm, sensible, responsible... Oh, wait. This is what people say to me, that he doesn't represent science to them. He represents Joseph Mengele, Dr. Joseph Mengele, uh, the, doc the Nazi doctor who did experiments on Jews during the Second World War and in the concentration camps. Oh, and later in that interview, Rand Paul also <laughs> went completely off the rails, suggesting the US government is withholding more effective vaccines because they probably have some money to make from it somewhere. Let's hope this is a milder variant, Chaz, because we do know that ignorance is highly transmissible in the United States and they have very low levels of immunity. That is definitely the case. But you reckon Rand Paul went off the rails? Mm. Ronnie Jackson, the presidential doctor turned <laughs> congressman, 
tweeted out that here comes the midterm election variant. They need a reason to push unsolicited nationwide mail-in ballots. Democrats will do anything to cheat during an election. So he reckons South Africa and the UK are in on the midterm conspiracy as well? Why not? Over at Fox and Friends, they seem to think that Pete Buttigieg might be behind the whole conspiracy somehow. Our transportation secretary is the, the, potentially our new president in you know 2024, or so the, the Democrats want, has said, we can't fix the supply chain problem until the pandemic is over, until COVID is over, and now we see these new variants. So that's the answer, is more lockdowns, more lockdowns, more fear, um, and therefore he doesn't have to do his job of fixing the supply chain because we'll just keep this whole thing going. It's yeah. always a new variant. And you can always, you'll count on a variant about every October. Now, I can't explain what they were on about, but I should explain what Fauci was on about before in that grab that John played earlier. This new Omicron variant has 32 mutations on the spike protein alone, which is the main protein many treatments use to attack variants with. By contrast, Delta has nine mutations on its spike protein, which is a massive issue for monoclonal treatments. That is, treatments which clone only one kind of antibody, like the antibody drug cocktail Regeneron which seems to be losing its effectiveness against Omicron because it's monoclonal and targets the spike protein. However, vaccines are polyclonal, so they may well have more luck. The Pfizer vaccine producers say we'll know for sure within two weeks whether the vaccine needs to be reformulated. Early results, though, are promising. The first leaked results suggest the Pfizer vaccine is just slightly less effective in preventing infection with Omicron than Delta. 90% effective for Omicron instead of 95% for Delta. Equally effective between the two in preventing serious symptoms. 93% effective against both. By the way, those same early results suggest that Omicron is about 1.3 times as infective as Delta and the unvaccinated are 2.4 times more likely to develop serious symptoms from it. But I stress those are very early results leaked to Israeli television. And should a new vaccine need to be produced, Moderna reckons they can do it in 100 days. Apparently they've been working on it non-stop for the last few days. Pfizer reckons they can produce a new vaccine in 31 days if needed. Or alternatively, you could just make Trump president and the new vaccines would have been here last week. President Trump was still in office, by the way. We'd already have modified vaccines to deal with the new variants, which is a great point. My favorite bit there is where he tells himself, that's a great point, because no one else is going to tell him that. Anyway, while we're waiting for more results, I should point out a few things about what's been observed so far in the real world. The thing which is making people most nervous about Omicron so far is just how rapidly it's dominating the other variants. The beta variant never represented more than 50% of the cases in South Africa at any one time. Delta took the best part of two months to dominate South Africa. Omicron has done it in two weeks. But there is an important disclaimer here. When the beta variant came on the scene, there were plenty of other COVID cases around. Same with when the Delta variant took over, whereas now, there are not many other COVID cases around for Omicron to beat out. That's the little red spike at the end there. So those raw numbers, if you look there, are not actually that scary. John also showed you before how a South African doctor feels that the Omicron cases to date have been quite mild. Indeed, while so far the Omicron wave of cases has been building faster than previous waves, the wave of hospitalizations has been utterly standard. That suggests that cases haven't been too dangerous. Except most of the cases have been healthy men, since only about 6% of South Africa's population is senior, so we don't actually know yet how this variant would affect the old and immunocompromised. In fact, slightly worryingly, in the epicenter of Omicron in South Africa, 10% of the hospital admissions have been to children under the age of two. And there have also been an increase in reinfections amongst those who supposedly have natural immunity. So there might be an issue there. Might be. We still don't know for sure, okay? Don't panic. In fact, some epidemiologists have expressed cautious optimism this could be the way out of the pandemic, with a variant that's less dangerous but more transmissible out-competing the deadlier variants. We'll see about that too. In the meantime, all the administration can do 
is recommended all adults get booster shots. Interestingly, there was a small study of 33 boosted people released just this week, which showed they had 23 times as many antibodies a week after the booster than they did before the booster, with the median post-booster patient having three times as many antibodies as those who had just had a second dose of the vaccine, and 53 times the antibodies levels of an unvaccinated patient who had recently recovered from having COVID. The boosted patients even had 68% more antibodies than those who had had COVID before and been vaccinated twice. So only a small sample there, John, but Definitely encouraging, given the variant. Fingers crossed. Yeah. We're joined by Dr. Sarah Medard now. She is one of America's leading experts in pathogen preparedness, as well as being an infectious diseases epidemiologist. Dr. Medard, welcome to Planet America. Thank you for having me on. So, Doctor, from your point of view, what are the key questions right now as we determine just what impact this new variant might be about to have? Well, with every variant, there's some key questions that we want to find out about, and this includes how transmissible is this new variant, uh, comparing it to, for example, the dominant one, Delta, is it going to outcompete Delta in any way, uh, form or fashion? Is it going to cause more severe illness for those that A, are unvaccinated and those that are vaccinated um, and they experience a brave infection? What does that also mean for them? And then also wanting to look at, you know, does this, is this going to, um, you know, impact our vaccine induced or our infection induced immunity uh, in any form or fashion. And then also lastly, any impact for diagnostics and therapeutics as well. So our PCR testing or antigen testing, as well as through monoclonal antibodies, and obviously new therapeutics are going to come out on the market here, for example, in the United States, like antiviral pills. So these are some of the key questions we want to look at, but Really, my big thing is, is it going to outcompete Delta? Delta obviously has set the bar really high in terms of variants of concern. This certainly feels like deja vu, but a bad type of deja vu where we're looking at this particular variant, the uh, Omicron, and we're seeing there's multiple different mutations. And that's not obviously the what we're so worried about is um, how these mutations actually play out in the real world and what impact is it going to have, you know, on all these different factors that I just mentioned. So those are some really key questions that we are hoping to find some more answers out, you know, on uh, in the next few days to a few weeks. Of course, the only reason we even know about Omicron is because of the strength of South Africa's genomic testing program. Now, in America, you're running genomic tests on what? Maybe 10% of samples. Why is it so low? And is that a problem? Well, I think first, you know, genomic uh, surveillance and, and testing first has greatly increased from where we were, uh, you know, uh, before this pandemic even began and once obviously it did uh, start and, and where we are now. So CDC, for example, has mentioned about 80,000, you know, uh, sequences being, you know, done um, per week. So about one in, in seven tests being conducted here in the U.S. So that certainly um, is not a, a small number. So there's a significant amount of uh, sequencing happening. Now, is it enough, right? That's the big question. Is it enough? And not only is it enough, but is it happening where it's covering the entire nation? You don't want to just take a small sample size from one jurisdiction. You want to obviously take it from a, uh, multiple different jurisdictions representing the entire United States, um, you know, and from multiple different uh, demographics and the like. So I think we can certainly do a much better job. There's still a patchwork in terms of our genomic surveillance capabilities. Um, I think monitoring has improved, but it's certainly not where we optimally want to be at. I certainly thank the scientists in South Africa for, you know, first, you know, um, detecting uh, this variant. As we know, the origin is something that's still up in the air. We may not ever find out where the origin uh, of this variant started, but it's because of their efforts and it's because of their transparency and sharing this data with the world that we're able to get a jump start on it. And that's really big news. So in the past week, the Biden administration acted with a selective travel ban from southern parts of Africa. Uh, uh, but Omicron is already in the United States, as we now know. So are they doing enough to slow its spread? Well, we need to obviously make sure that we're reducing transmission in any form or fashion. And we have the tools and the resources to do it. So it's not like, you know, this particular variant is, is you know, uh, evading all of our tools in our toolbox. And this obviously includes not only testing and genomic surveillance, but obviously vaccination, booster shots, masking, ventilation, distancing, all of these things need to be used. And we know with, you know, um, the Omicron variant, it's been detected in over 20 different countries, including the United States. These travel bans certainly obviously are more of a political move in that sense. Is it actually going to reduce transmission? Is it going to slow uh, the number of new infections? 
you know, that's a bit of a gamble. If you couple travel bans with, uh, you know, um, testing, or if you have travel restrictions with testing and quarantining, that adds a better layer of protection and helping slow the spread and preventing new infections from arising. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's a political move, but if you combine it with other, you know, public health measures, it becomes a little bit more impactful. Another issue in the past for America has been the low number and high cost of rapid tests on the market. Uh, are there enough readily accessible, cheap, rapid tests now in order for America to be prepared for a new variant? Well, I think it really depends where you're living. I'm here in New York. They are more accessible. If I go to, you know, my local pharmacy, I can drive two miles, three miles, four miles. There's a pharmacy almost in every neighborhood now. And you're able to, you know, uh, pick up uh, these at-home tests. The cost of it is another barrier. Some of these tests could be anywhere from $20. Uh, the federal government has tried to reduce the prices, so you can sometimes find uh, these at-home tests for you know, $10 or less, but they are pricey. That still matters to many people economically, whether it's $5, $10, or $20. It's it's money out of their own pockets, and that's, that's an issue of itself. Should we provide free at-home tests to all households? Um, in my opinion, yes. Obviously, this is a pandemic, and we know that's another really important layer of protection of testing on an ongoing basis. Uh, so the cost is a barrier. Accessibility is still a, an issue in certain parts of the United States. So if you go to another state, it may be a little bit different in terms of where they can access these at-home tests. But generally speaking, we have been doing a better job. Can we do a even better job? Uh, that That is absolutely true. We, we can't. Dr. Madad, some are expressing some optimism at this point that maybe Omicron could become a more virulent but less deadly form of the virus and become the dominant form and that this could ultimately be a good thing in ending the pandemic. Uh, when will we know if that sort of best case scenario is going to come to play? Well, first, when we talk about, you know, a disease being endemic, it's because, you know, you're seeing less amount of morbidity and mortality and preferably it is through immunity in the population. So whether it is vaccine induced, which obviously is a much more preferred way because it's reducing the number of people that are getting newly infected, or it's through actual um, infection induced immunity. And that's when you start seeing, you know, a disease become endemic, you know, in our communities and something that we can live with. Now with this new variant, there certainly is a lot of key questions that remain um, unanswered. And it can go both ways. It could be a much more transmissible variant where anecdotal where right now, anecdotally, that is what we are hearing, that it seems to be much more transmissible than Delta. So, for example, Delta had an r naught of 5 to 8. We're hearing that with Omicron, it could be, you know, um, higher than that. We're not exactly sure how much higher, but that is what some of these reports are saying. On the other end, in terms of severity of illness, you are seeing a spectrum. There are reports of mild cases, but there's also reports of severe cases. And we know that um, severe illness or hospitalization are, are a lagging indicator. So we're not going to know for, I would say, another couple of weeks of whether this is truly, uh, a, you know, a variant that's going to cause um, less, you know, severe illness or mild illness or more severe um, illness compared to, to Delta. Um, and that's where this combination of mutations that's, that we're seeing is going to, to play out. And it's really important not only that we see it uh, play out uh, in the lab and what this means, but also in real world. That's where it matters is in the real world. Um, what is this going to show us and what is this going to look like? So I, I think that 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 is a question to be answered in the next you know couple of weeks. But there are many different scenarios here. But we're not exactly sure which one is actually truly going to play out. Well, new variants or not, America is heading into winter. Uh, this time last year, they faced a massive spike of cases and deaths. Europe is having a spike right now. So has America been vaccinated enough to at least avoid a spike in deaths? Or are you fearing the worst? Well, even before, you know, this uh, Omicron variant took the headlines, we were, you know, on the either the, the tail end of another, uh, you know, um, longer fourth, fourth surge or, you know, well into our fifth surge, however, you know, folks want to define it. But we obviously have been seeing an increased number of cases. In fact, you know, close to 20 to 30 percent increase over the past, uh, you know, 14 days. And so we were already seeing higher numbers of new infections. We did see hospitalizations pick up and over, you know, two dozen States, so this was not something new, um, and and I think that in terms of our vaccination rates, 
I think depending on what state you're in, and that's where there's so much variability. So for example, I'm here in New York, we have a good vaccination rate, not the best, but it's better than many states. For example, we have 80% of adults here in New York that have been that have received at least one dose. And so that's a that's a um, you know a good rate, but obviously we can do better. But is it enough to you know uh, stave off uh, hospitalizations and death? We certainly were seeing that. So if you compare those that were unvaccinated versus those who were vaccinated and who was being hospitalized, you saw that unvaccinated individuals had a seven times increase of being hospitalized versus those that were vaccinated. So we were seeing um, the benefits of vaccination at the community level. But again, now with this new variant, we're not exactly sure what that's going to, to mean. Uh, we're hoping obviously you know, for the best, and this is where we need to continue to employ all of our public health measures that we know that work. And as we learn more about this new variant, we can adjust our public health strategies accordingly. Dr. Sara Madad, thank you for being with us on Planet America. Anytime, thank you. For the stats, the daily cases look like they might be dropping for a while there, but no, they're pushing 100,000 a day again. The hospitalizations are continuing to rise again, and deaths can't quite make up their mind what they're doing at this point in time. By popular demand, one last look for the year at the states comparison. This is all Australia's states and territories combined with America's states, showing the percentage of the population that is fully vaccinated. ACT, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania are number one, two, three and four. Then you've got six US states before South Australia, skip seven more states and then you've got Queensland, Western Australia and Northern Territory all pretty much next to each other and better than 30 American states. In other words, we are significantly more vaccinated than America is. How much more? Well, these are the most fully vaccinated countries with more than a million vaccine doses each. You have Singapore and Portugal at the top there in the mid 80%. Then you've got America languishing at number 56 now in the world on 59%. They've been in the high 50s for months. Australia is now at number 23 on 73%. Not bad. Not exactly top of the world either, though. Anyway, you can see why Biden wanted to pass a vaccine mandate for federal government employees. It has worked, by the way. It's worked so well that 96.5% of the federal workforce is now in compliance with that vaccine mandate. Uh, the administration has now decided not to suspend or fire workers for not complying after all, at least not till next year. So that is good news for the Biden administration. Not such good news for Biden, though, is that literally every other vaccine mandate he announced a few months back have now been held up by the courts. There's a national injunction on his vaccine mandate for federal government contractors and the federal government subcontractors. Even a national injunction on his vaccine mandate for healthcare workers. So that is not handy with a new variant popping into the picture. Now, Chaz, to the surprisingly not surprising news that former President Donald Trump tested positive to COVID-19 a few days before that fiery first presidential debate against Joe Biden in October last year. But he and the White House kept that fact a secret. The Guardian this week reporting that Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, has written a memoir and he says nothing was going to stop Trump from going out there on the debate stage and that he then returned a negative result from a second different test shortly after that first positive. Former President Trump responded to that report this week in rather predictable fashion. The story of me having COVID prior to or during the first debate is fake news. In fact, a test revealed that I did not have COVID prior to the debate. Well, it was one positive and one negative at that point, and the fact is that Trump again tested positive three days after the debate when he had his next test, as far as we know. And that night he was hospitalised. It took us several months to then discover just how gravely ill he was at that point. Trump also skipped a COVID test that he was supposed to take immediately before stepping onto that debate stage with Joe Biden because he turned up late at the debate venue and they had to go live on TV. So, when was Donald Trump infected? Well, we don't know. He had hosted that White House function for his Supreme Court pick, Amy Coney Barrett, the day before that first positive test. And that event is now regarded as a super spreader event. We may never know if Trump was or was not contagious on that debate stage, whether he put Joe Biden 
or others at risk. We do know at least nine cases of COVID to come out of that debate. Whether also Donald Trump continuing campaigning that week spread the virus further, again, we don't know. We do know he likely gave it to close associates like Chris Christie, who was helping him with his debate prep. He ended up in intensive care a few days later. And we also know that when Trump was in hospital, he then exposed his Secret Service detail when he went on that joyride in a Jeep during the hospital stay. All of which is really, Chaz, a timely reminder of just how recklessly Donald Trump mishandled the pandemic last year, whatever he says about it today. This week, the United States Supreme Court heard a case that could well be the most significant to come before it in almost half a century and dramatically limit the rights of American women to terminate a pregnancy. After consistently ruling that the Constitution protects a woman's right to choose, the court today takes up a challenge that says those decisions were all wrong. The case, Dodd versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, is testing the constitutionality of a Mississippi state law that limits abortion to 15 weeks after conception. A ruling in favour of that law will potentially go a lot further than just reducing the time a woman has to seek an abortion by about two months. It could also see women in many parts of America effectively unable to terminate a pregnancy at all in their state. In 1973, the landmark Roe v. Wade case established that unduly restrictive state regulation of abortion was unconstitutional and that a woman had a constitutional right to privacy that allowed her to terminate a pregnancy up to the point at which a fetus becomes viable, around 24 weeks. This Mississippi law is a clear challenge to that. So, if that law is upheld, Roe precedent is overturned. Lawyer for the Centre for Reproductive Rights, Julie Rickleman, argued the case against the Mississippi law before the Supreme Court and tried to highlight the gravity of winding back what has been regarded as a fundamental right for American women for almost 50 years. We had, we had a fair opportunity to make our arguments. Um, again, I think we tried to say everything that we thought it was critical for the court to know, including that taking away a constitutional right would really be um, a tremendous step for the court to take, a constitutional right that women have had for 50 years. And we try to emphasize just how important the right has been to women's ability to pursue a profession, to their health, to their lives, to pursue an education. It's critical to women's equal status in society. But Mississippi's Attorney General Lynn Fitch argued that her state's law recognises the advances that have been made since 1973 and what the definition of viability should be, and she says it should change, as should the rights of the unborn child. You know, over the past 50 years, our world has changed. Technology's changed, science has changed, and certainly we know that life can be detected in the womb much earlier. Now, in theory, Supreme Court justices are supposed to judge cases based on the Constitution of the United States. But, like any document, the Constitution leaves room for interpretation. And the jurisprudence and ideology of those justices tends to be the lens through which they view particularly contentious cases. Supreme Court justices are appointed by presidents and confirmed by the Senate, so they are to an extent inherently political anyway. And right now, thanks to the three conservative justices appointed by President Donald Trump, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, added to the George Bush appointed Clarence Thomas and the George W. Bush appointed Samuel Alito and Chief Justice John Roberts, there are six conservatives to now just three progressives. Stephen Breyer, who was appointed by Bill Clinton, and the Obama appointees Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. OK, well, let's talk about these interpretations then. Uh, it was pretty clear that Chief Justice Roberts, at least, was keen to stay close to established precedent during those arguments. And in this case, the relevant precedent is Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. Casey laid out a two-part framework. One, you couldn't prohibit any woman from having an abortion before the fetus was viable. John mentioned that before, the 24-week mark. And two, you can regulate abortion as long as you don't impose an undue burden on the right to an abortion. So, Roberts tried to discard the viability part but keep the undue burden part, asking, if you think that women should have a choice to terminate their pregnancy, why would 15 weeks be an inappropriate line? Viability, it seems to me, doesn't have anything to do with choice. But if it really is an issue about choice, why is 15 weeks not enough time? 
which is a good try from him, but nobody was supporting him, not even the pro choices. Gorsuch asked Rickleman if the court were to extend the undue burden standard to regulations prior to viability, would that be workable in your view? She said it would not be workable. So much for that idea. Meanwhile, Brett Kavanaugh appeared to be crafting the position of the five more conservative judges when he paraphrased what he saw as the case against Roe versus Wade. He said that the Constitution is neutral on the question of abortion. The Constitution is neither pro-life nor pro-choice on the question of abortion, and therefore it should be left to the people, to the states, or to Congress. So, what does this mean in the real world? Well, if the court were to simply allow Mississippi's 15-week abortion limit and stop right there, then it might not necessarily mean much. By the 15th week of pregnancy, about 95% of abortions have already taken place. Post 15 week abortions would still be allowed in blue states as well. But I don't think anyone believes the Supreme Court is going to stop there. And if they do overturn Roe versus Wade completely, wow, there are 21 states that have laws or constitutional provisions already in place that will be triggered to ban abortion almost immediately. Mind you, 13 of those 21 states already have four or less abortion clinics, so they're not too easy to get abortions in even now. But what happens if the total bans roll in? I've got no idea. There is so much confusion in abortion polling right now, it's hard to know where America stands. For example, in YouGov's last poll, 54% of people want to keep Roe versus Wade. Yet only 44% in the same poll oppose Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban that would totally destroy Roe versus Wade. Another example. Only 38% of people who live in states with the aforementioned trigger laws know that abortion will become illegal in their state if Roe v. Wade is overturned. Only 35% of those in states without trigger laws realise that abortion will stay legal in their states. So, John, that Republican judicial experiment has just revved up a few gears. Yeah, certainly has. Joining us now is Mary Ziegler, author of the book Abortion and the Law in America, A Legal History, Roe v. Wade to the Present. She's also a professor of law at Florida State University. Professor Ziegler, welcome to Planet America. Thank you for having me. I wonder, can you try and put this into some kind of historical perspective for us? If Roe versus Wade is overturned, just how significant an event is that for a legal precedent like this to be thrown out after nearly 50 years? It would be quite unusual. There have only been a handful of landmark cases that the court has overruled in the past. And generally, that's happened when the court's been expanding constitutional liberties rather than contracting them. Um, there was one past case um, when the court uh, eliminated a right to freedom of contract. But beyond that, it's quite unusual to see the court tell people that they believe they had a constitutional right that they don't, in fact, have. So we'd be looking at something quite historic. Professor, it seemed like there were four pretty clear votes to overturn Roe versus Wade during the oral arguments. Uh, Gorsuch, Thomas, Alito and Kavanaugh. What's your read on the potential fifth vote, the crucial one, Amy Coney Barrett? It was a little harder to tell. I mean, I think she's probably leaning toward reversing row two. The question that seemed to interest her the most was the question of whether um, women relied on the availability of abortion to achieve equal citizenship. And she seemed skeptical of this. Um, she suggested that while uh, eliminating an abortion right would certainly affect people's bodily integrity, right? And in an interest, she, she compared being pregnant to having to get a vaccine you don't want. Um, she suggested that there would be no further implications because people who didn't want a parent could um, ostensibly give their children up for adoption, which would suggest that she'd be open to overruling Roe too. Uh, the alternative um, that Chief Justice John Roberts sketched out would be to say that you can ban abortion before viability, which isn't the law under Roe v. Wade, but that you the court wouldn't go all the way to saying there is no right to choose abortion. And Chief Justice Roberts seemed interested in that. And at some points, Amy Coney Barrett did as well, which is, I think, why she emerged as the sort of um, least clear vote uh, going into whether it will be overturned immediately or perhaps over the course of several decisions. And I wonder from your perspective, was that attempt from Chief Justice Roberts to try and sort of reach a compromise settlement on a 15 week viability threshold uh, about the law or about the politics of this? I mean, both, I think. I think Chief Justice Roberts was 
um, essentially saying that he didn't think viability had anything to do with, with the Constitution or the idea of self-determination. Uh, politically, I think certainly he was looking for a way to manage the kind of political fallout there might be for the court if it does something that will probably be widely regarded as partisan. Uh, I think the law and politics for him went together on this one. On that half a loaf scenario being proposed by the Chief Justice, why do you think pro-choice advocates weren't helping Roberts more to construct that option? Because it seems like that's abortion's best bet at the moment. Well, I think that the, the pro-choice movement in the U.S. has taken the position that the court is going to overrule Roe, whether it overrules Roe this year or next year, and whether it does so clearly or not clearly, it's going to happen. And I think the movement's position is that if this is going to move into, into politics, that it's better for everyone to be crystal clear about what the Supreme Court is doing so that there can be a, an accurate political response from American voters and politicians. So I think that uh, there's a sense in which the pro-choice movement thinks it's better off with a clear repudiation of Roe than a sort of shell of Roe that the justices can use to sort of protect themselves while giving states more or less the same leeway to ban abortion. I wonder as well, based on how things were before Roe in 1973 and, and in the, the time since then, how do you think this is likely to play out politically once presumably the powers are then handed back to the states to decide what their individual abortion laws are going to be? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. In national politics, um, most Americans don't want Roe v. Wade overruled. And so you think, and you would think that in national races, um, it would help Democrats. Of course, the caveat being that we don't know what other issues might seem more pressing at the time, whether that's COVID or economic issues or climate change. Um, I think in some other scenarios, it may actually not particularly help Democrats. Because for people who are very conservative, the overruling of Roe v. Wade has been, you know, a lifetime in coming. And of course, the end of Roe v. Wade isn't the point for these social conservatives. The point is to ban abortion outright. So it'll be just the beginning of a broader struggle and potentially to overrule or eliminate many other constitutional rights as well. Um, and so I think it, it's going to be a little hard to predict how it will play out. But, it, but it's worth remembering, of course, that um, the U.S. government isn't fully representative to begin with. The Senate uh, reflects, um, gives more power to rural states. There are many state and local races that are not competitive or gerrymandered. And so we would expect to see um, those politicians either benefiting from this or being able to ignore any kind of political fallout that national politicians might not face or might face, actually. For all the talk of a neutral constitution that we've been hearing over the last few days, what do you think the chances are that in a few years' time we're going to find ourselves right back in the same position watching the same six Conservative justices pondering amongst themselves whether state abortion laws are actually unconstitutional? It, the only way that isn't going to happen is if the Supreme Court doesn't want to take that case because anti-abortion lawyers are going to give them the opportunity. There are already amicus briefs in this case arguing that abortion itself is unconstitutional. Um, and I think you could see... Uh, as, as you mentioned, Justice Brett Kavanaugh arguing that the Constitution is scrupulously neutral, neither pro-choice nor pro-life, in his words. But um, it's not clear if there are uh, other justices who agree with him on that. At the moment, I don't think there are enough votes to hold that abortion is unconstitutional. But, you know, you wouldn't have thought a few years ago that there would be enough votes to overrule Roe v. Wade either. So I think what's possible is rapidly changing. I wonder, Professor, in your view, could a ruling ultimately overturning Roe versus Wade have implications for other precedent cases, particularly those surrounding the question of individual liberties, as Roe does, uh, marriage equality possibly being the foremost among them? Yeah, I think they'll, they'll be up for grabs. I mean, Justices Alito and Thomas have already suggested that they would be thinking about or desiring to reconsider same-sex marriage and even a decision saying that you can't constitutionally criminalize same-sex sex. Uh, I think it'll be a little bit harder in the sense that some of the arguments that apply that justify overruling Roe would be harder to make in the context of same-sex marriage, but others would not because, of course, the conservative justice's position is that there, there can be no constitutional right to do something um, if at the time the 14th Amendment, the relevant constitutional provision was written, 
uh, it wasn't recognized as part of our nation's history and tradition. And of course, in the 19th century, um, same-sex marriage was illegal and states had begun to more vigorously punish same-sex sex. So it, there's no reason you couldn't apply that argument to same-sex marriage. Whether the, the Supreme Court will want to take that up, I think, is a different question. Justice Sotomayor argued that the overturning of Roe versus Wade will be seen as judicial activism, but presumably the right would say that the original Roe versus Wade decision was the actual judicial activism and they're just correcting the record now. What's your response to an argument like that? Well, I mean, of course, no, but judicial activism is one of those things that's that's in the eye of the beholder. I think um, the reality is that the court will be perceived as partisan probably no matter what it does, but particularly, I think, if it overrules Roe quickly, because Justice Sotomayor's point was not necessarily just that the court will be over will be viewed as partisan if it if it overrules Roe, but that it will be viewed as particularly partisan if it overrules Roe quickly as soon as its composition changes, which seems to be what's going to happen here. And so I think it's it's a matter of the court seeming to take this seriously. Um, which I think a quick overruling may not signal. Professor, assuming that Roe is overturned next year and the Supreme Court is now viewed, possibly quite rightly, as yet another partisan institution in a hyper-partisan United States, is there any way back from that for the court or is that just now the new reality? I mean, I think there's coming back from that. I mean, I, I, I think um, the question to me is if the justices on this court want to, um, I don't know if it's the case that the court, the members of the current court don't care about that sort of thing because they don't think it's their job. They think it's their job just to focus on interpreting the law, um, even if the, the way they do so happens to line up with their political preferences almost all the time. Um, it may be that they don't care because the legal community has polarized much as the rest of the United States has. Um, and so I think that the problem is sort of how do you come back from this is obviously broader than the court and sort of reflects, as you mentioned, the broader polarization of, of the United States. Professor, things can move very quickly after the Supreme Court rules. That's likely in June or July next year. If they strike down Roe, what happens the next day in the abortion clinics of America, in the courts of America, in the legislatures of America? Uh, what is that all going to look like? Um, those those clinics will close or people will go to prison and probably for a very long time. Um, there will be people who are, um, you know, doing other forms of care for pregnant people that will probably stop doing it in some circumstances because they're afraid that they are going to go to prison too. Um, there are going to be a lot of battlegrounds, um, the sort of traditional swing states where it'll be unclear if abortion is going to be criminalized or not. Um, and we should expect it to be explosive. Um, I don't. I don't think we've seen an overruling of a Supreme Court decision like this um, in decades. So I think it's also, I would imagine, going to be unpredictable. Um, exactly how it will play out politically, medically, criminally, um, and I think we'll just have to stay tuned. Professor Ziegler, we appreciate your time. Thanks for being with us on Planet America. Thank you. Yes, time for a final fireside chat for 2021, Chaz. And December, with the holidays approaching, it rather focuses the minds of members of Congress. The clock is ticking if they want to be home to their families and, more importantly, their congressional districts in time for the, uh, the end of the year. Uh, in the last few hours, the House has passed a temporary spending bill to avoid a December government shutdown, which... Nobody really liked the idea of it. It's still got to pass the Senate. But they've got a lot more work to get done and the clock is ticking, surely. They really do. And we shouldn't just, just brush past that, that temporary spending bill either because in the Senate, some people like Ted Cruz, for instance, are quite keen to hold it ransom to defunding the vaccine mandate, which is pointless because it's been held up by the courts anyway. Mm. But if they do, if they do hold it hostage, they, they're only going to put off for a few days, but enough for a shutdown. So that, then we go off to the races again with a shutdown. But the, the, what they've got left also, they've got to pass the defence amendment, yep. which is defence funding for the next year. Which is meant to be the easy one. Mm. And this week turned out not to be quite so easy as they had hoped, which is sort of a bit like stumbling on the first hurdle. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a whole bunch of uh, amendments uh, that are part of that which are quite controversial. Like, for instance, uh, one of them is... Uh, women being included in the draft, mm. which uh, some conservatives aren't 
keen about. Yeah, so we're going to see a lot of emotional arguments around these things. Are you really not going to pass this bill, Senator, because you'll leave our you know, men and women in the fighting forces in harm's way without bullets in their guns or food in their bellies? How can you possibly live with yourself? But when it comes to Biden's uh, latest big spending bill, the social spending bill, that is also slated to come up to a vote in the Senate uh, in the next couple of weeks. And right now, it's hard to tell whether it's going to make it. Well, yeah, there hasn't been much progress in the last week and a half since the House passed no. uh, passed the bill. Uh, Joe Manchin's been surprisingly quiet for Joe Manchin. Mm. <laughs> Usually, so impressively so. Yeah, so we'll see what happens there. But we shouldn't we shouldn't ignore the big one, which is the debt ceiling, mm. because as of December fifteen they might default. Yep. They're not quite sure what the day is, but somewhere after December 15, America might default. And plan A for the Democrats is we're going to tie these things together. So we pass we pass all this spending while also overcoming the, the debt uh, uh, limit issue because without doing that, of course, America is not uh, paying its bills, goes into default, and that's serious, serious stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, and the problem we've got is that People like Trump, uh, not just him either, a lot of conservatives are putting real pressure on McConnell to not give in at all on mm. the debt ceiling, uh, to play hardball. And if they do play hardball, everyone loses. Yeah. Because, yeah, because it, depending on the procedure you go through, they, they may need Republicans to mm. play ball. Yeah, one way of looking at this, though, is that Republicans don't mind if Democrats get their way and spend this money. Mm because their narrative heading into next year's midterm elections, 11 months from now, is going to be Democrats, they're spending like drunken sailors, they're going to increase your taxes. We learnt this week with the oral arguments in the, uh, in the Dodd v Jackson case that Democrats are going to be teeing this up as a, a woman's right to choose midterm election mm. to try and drive out their base of support come November next year. Both sides, therefore, trying to define the battleground on very favourable terms to them, who do you think gets to win that argument over what next year's election is going to be about? <laughs> it's a bit early to make that call. Come think, on, uh, we're, not, we're not going to be back for six months. We what? can make a few rash calls. <laughs> well, what I would say is I would say that, to be honest, I don't think either is going to be the defining feature of who wins the election. It's mm. going to be based on two things. Mm. The same two things we've been talking about all year and we'll be talking about all next year. The pandemic and the economy. Yeah. The, the, the inflation issues that, that, that America is having at the moment are not going to be going away anytime in the next month or two. They need to go away by summer because if gas prices are going through the roof next summer again, then people will remember that when they vote in November. The pandemic, there's no issue more associated with Joe Biden's election campaign than get than, than ending the pandemic. He must have said a thousand times, mm. I won't shut down the economy, I will shut down the pandemic. They will wrap that around his neck at the next election if it's mm. not gone by the middle of next year. And we just don't know whether this new Omicron variant is going to be like Delta, worse than Delta. Is it going to be adding to the supply chain snarls that we've seen over the last eight months or, or so? Uh, is uh, any of the measures the Biden administration taking to try and lower gasoline prices uh, going to make a difference? But this could well be another winter of discontent for the United States. Just as there was a huge psychological blow back in this past northern uh, summer, the United States thought that things were going to be great in June, July and August, and they weren't. Delta came along. Now Omicron comes along, just as their vaccination levels are kind of getting up and... We're just going to have to wait and see just how bad it gets. But you're right, the Pottery Barn rule applies. Joe Biden now owns this, even if he didn't break it. He hasn't fixed it in a year. He certainly hasn't. Uh, what I would say is, I mean, th this winter is a big winter for all the things that we've just been talking about. But I, I, I can't help thinking that even if it's a complete mess, that's not a disaster for Biden and the Democrats. It's the spring that matters. Like, mm. cause, like there's been a lot of research on what, on just when the cutoff is on people's attention span when, yep. for elections. Usually, 
seems to be around summer. Yeah. So, so if the show isn't back on the road by July or August, it's too late. He's done. Yeah. History so, says anyway, whether even if the economy is roaring back next year, mm. save a major disruptive event like a 9-11, the incumbent party tends to go backwards quite substantially mm. in the first midterm elections. And yet uh, Democrats are wheeling out some big guns, at least at the gubernatorial level, if not at the congressional level so far, with Beto O'Rourke, no surprises, but he has confirmed he is running for governor of Texas. Matthew McConaughey, who is possibly a third-party spoiler, is, is, is not running. Meanwhile, in Georgia, Stacey Abrams is running as well uh, for, for governor there, both of whom have also made voting rights and voter access a big, big issue. So their campaigns are state-based, but they're creating templates that they will be hoping that other congressional candidates will be able to follow to try and spring a few upsets next year. Bayo O'Rourke, bit of a joke, but Stacey Abrams, I think, I think is an important one. And the reason why, number one, she's got an amazing get out the vote operation she's been working on for years, which will presumably get out the vote in Georgia at the same time as the Reverend is running for re-election in the Senate, mm. our Reverend Warnock. And if she gets him up, but through her efforts to Maybe promote herself, yeah, that may save the Senate. Because it's been mm. really close. Because the Democrats have a lot of seats in their favour in this particular election, but the Republicans have the times in their favour at, at the midterms. So they're going to say that. So you'd think the Republicans might win the Senate, but. Just one seat mm. in Georgia might make all the difference. Quick reflection on the year that was. 12 months ago, we were sitting here in the aftermath of, of uh, a very uh, divisive election campaign. But even though at the time Donald Trump wasn't accepting defeat, we knew he'd lost and that this was just a, a matter of course. Then, of course, we saw what happened on January the 6th. And now we know even more than we did in the aftermath of that just how close America came to something approaching a coup d'etat, or at least having the president, by rejecting the result of the election, pressuring state officials not to certify the results in their state, therefore handing him the victory in the Electoral College. We now know, and he's confirmed, that was his strategy. He needed Mike Pence to get in the way on January 6th, possibly uh, with the disruption of those rioters on Capitol Hill as well. What's remarkable to me is that 12 months later... Donald Trump still has 85% approval within the Republican Party, the overwhelming favourite to become their nominee in 2024. And right now, head-to-head -head with Joe Biden, if the election was held today, he would probably win that election. This is a man who was voted by historians the fourth worst president in history, who created greater strains on American democracy than anyone since the Civil War. And yet, potentially, by the time we come back next year, he could be off and running and maybe... Re on his way to re-election. Historians don't vote in the Republican primary. <laughs> really? <laughs> and, once, and once you're the nominee, it's, it, anyone can win when you're yeah. the nominee. It's, just, it's, a, it's a question of whether you, whether you like or hate the incumbent, essentially. So, yeah, so he's, he's in a great position. It's a, well, I would say, though, when you mention the, the, uh, the coup d'etat, um, the, 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 that this next year... It's going to be very important for the Democrats to get their investigating done while they still hold the House and the Senate. We've already seen what Trump's strategy is. It's just to play out time, just to try and make as many... Uh, to, to be as disruptive as possible to the Commission so they have to go to the court to do anything, dredge it out in the court, just spin it out, spin it out, try to just wait 12 months. The question is going to be, can the Democrats get anything done as far as oversight goes? Because... In 12 months' time, time might be up. The other question, though, for me is with the likes of Mark Meadows, his last chief of staff, who's written himself a memoir and is now cooperating with <laughs> congressional investigators, are there still some Republicans who would quite like to sabotage a Donald Trump comeback? And clearly, we've heard, we've read the books, we've seen the quotes, he's a moron, he's an idiot, he's a fifth grader, he's irresponsible, he's reckless... These are the people that worked with him on a day-to-day -day basis. No. They're the ones who could potentially scuttle this if they want to, yeah. but they keep looking at that 85% of Republicans that say, yeah, he, he, he may be crazy, but he's our crazy. We've heard this story before. There yeah. might be people trying to scuttle him anonymously. No-one's going to put their name to it. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Well, 
We will see what happens. That is it for this week and this year. Happy holidays to you and your families. We will be back in the second half of 2022 in plenty of time for the midterm congressional elections. And no doubt we'll be popping up on the news channel and elsewhere if something really big happens in the meantime. Something big's going to happen. It always <laughs> does. We are going to give you a well-earned rest from us. Uh, but not quite yet. I've got one more pep for you. Not tonight. I'm going to put it out over the weekend. So uh, you can find it right there. Yeah. And on behalf of our little team here at Planet America, thank you for watching this year. Thanks to our families and friends, including the four-legged oh, ones, George. George. We'll be seeing a little bit more of them for the next little while as well. Yes, that's right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Such a good boy.